Hello, this is Mr. Mike for the Mechanicsburg Learning Center with another episode of Mr. Mike's Dino a Day. Do this every day live on Facebook, 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, beginning tomorrow, we will be moving and shifting our show time to 1 p.m. So make a note of that. We will do Monday through Friday at least of uh, this coming week. Uh, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time live on Facebook. And of course, we will post all of our videos to uh, YouTube. Just look for Mr. Mike Scrignoli. So thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you for liking and subscribing. Uh, please hit the like button and uh, please watch them all. You'll enjoy them. Today, a very light subject for us to discuss for episode number 76, if you can believe it. 76. Yeah, episode 76, a very light subject. We're going to talk about Mass extinctions. Wow. Mass extinctions have taken place on Earth. Uh, most people know about the one that took place about 65 and a half million years ago that took care of most of the large dinosaurs. Uh, nothing really was left of the large dinosaurs once the, this mass extinction occurred. But did you know that uh, this has occurred in Earth's history five different times. We have had five mass extinctions. So there's a lot, uh, a lot of things that we have learned from all of these. And it's very interesting to note what kind of animals end up surviving, because in many cases, uh, virtually, you know, 90, 95, 96% of everything living on Earth is destroyed. And then Earth, uh, life finds a way and uh, comes back. So Today we're going to specifically talk about what took care of the big dinosaurs about 65 and a half million years ago. Um, many, many theories existed over the years, um, and people thought that they just died out naturally. They thought maybe something disease-like took them, maybe there was a plague, maybe the climate was changing, and when they were used to a certain temperature, and uh, if that temperature shifted... Maybe that uh, caused them to freeze. Maybe there was too much egg predation. In other words, maybe the dinosaurs did it to themselves because some dinosaurs did like to eat dinosaur eggs. And if you don't have eggs, you don't have baby dinosaurs. And if you don't have baby dinosaurs, the uh, species cannot continue. So there were so many uh, theories. Another one was that the dinosaurs' bodies just got so big and their brains remained so small, they just couldn't function. That was an interesting theory. Um, they also said that they just starved. They ran out of a food source uh, because there were so many of them. They were doing so well. I mean, uh, dinosaurs ruled the earth for 160 million years. Uh, so when you refer to something, I always get a kick out of this when, when someone says, wow, you're a real dinosaur, meaning that uh, you can't learn anything new or you're stuck in the past or you're just not open to uh, new technology or something like that. Well, got news for you. Dinosaurs were the most uh, successful uh, species of animal ever to exist on the earth. So we shouldn't uh, downplay the importance and the fact that they were so long staying on the earth. 160 million years. Humans have quite a ways to go to, uh, to match that. Uh, and I really hope that we do do that. So. At any rate, uh, the mass extinction, 65 and a half million years ago. It's referred to as the KT extinction, which stands for Cretaceous Tertiary. Now, the word Cretaceous actually starts with a C, but to simplify things, they make they they take Cretaceous and make it a K, so it's the KT extinction. So the theories were that uh, this extinction took place for the variety of uh, reasons that I mentioned, but there really wasn't any good proof as to show what exactly happened. When you are a paleontologist and you're scraping through rock and you go layer by layer by layer and the lower the layer you get into, the more ancient the layer was laid down. So the, the deeper the rock layer, the older the rock. So they get to this area, which was a thin, dark strip. It was only one centimeter wide of a layer. Uh, and it, you, you can see the definition on the side of the rock. It has all these different layers, and then one of them is very dark. And this is 65 and a half million years old. So we know it was laid down right at the same time, give or take a couple 
hundred thousand years, right at the same time that the dinosaurs all went extinct, at least the big ones. And beneath this line, we find dinosaur bones. Above this line, we don't. So that's pretty good evidence that this, whatever took place, uh, took care of the big boys. Now, so again, this is all theory. In fact, back in 1956, a Russian astronomer, his name was uh, Joseph Shilovsky, or Skilovsky, he came up with the idea that something big took place and eradicated uh, the dinosaurs. This is back in, as I said, 1956. He felt maybe it was a supernova, an exploding star that just uh, showered radiation down on the Earth and killed all the dinosaurs. Well, he was on the right track. Something did, in fact, shower down, and we all know now that it was a giant meteor. Uh, this meteor was somewhere in the neighborhood of six miles to maybe even ten miles wide. This is a big chunk of rock slamming into the earth. Uh, and if you think of somebody taking a pretty good chunk of rock and launching it into a pond, and then you see the reverberations, you see what happens when it hits the water. It's kind of the same analogy of when this big gigantic meteor struck the earth. This is what they thought. And this little black line that they discovered in the soil was full of a, of a material called iridium. And you don't find iridium normally on the earth at all. And you don't really find it above the line and above below the line. There's but a thin strip of iridium, which is uh, really found in uh, abundance in outer space. So the theory begins to take shape, whereas the meteor hits the earth, the meteor is full of iridium, and it lays down a layer of iridium pretty much all over the world. Because this all came to be, or at least this theory, and the, uh, the evidence from this theory came from two gentlemen, a father and son, Louis, the father, and Walter Alvarez. Uh, this was back in 1981 that they published their findings saying, we have found iridium in the earth and in a small one centimeter wide layer Above it, we find nothing. Below it, we find dinosaur bones. So their theory really began to have credence. When it was first published in 1981, people scoffed. They ridiculed it. They thought this is ridiculous. Uh, he was a noted, uh, Alvarez was a noted uh, scientist, but this was really, really out there. Uh, but since then, really, a lot of evidence has begun to pile up that we believe they were absolutely right. But they didn't have something called the smoking gun. Okay, so we have the evidence. We have the iridium. We have the fact that dinosaurs existed down here, but not up here in the, in the rock layer. A um, lot of evidence. But where in the world did this thing hit the earth? If you have a six-mile or ten-mile long hunk of rock smash into the earth, there's got to be evidence of it somewhere. But it eluded the Alvarezes until someone in 1991 discovered something. Now, the reason I bring this up is uh, hopefully a lot of us were watching the NASA SpaceX uh, blast-off yesterday. And I don't know if you noticed one particular thing I did. As the, uh, the astronauts turned to look at the camera, there was something floating by them, and it happened to be a dinosaur model. So it got me thinking, because they have taken dinosaur bones into space. But as the ast astronauts ascend, as they deploy, as they move away from the Earth, you get a view of Earth that few other humans have ever seen. And sometimes it takes that perspective to get a real look at what the Earth looks like. And Way ended up discovering in 1991 a crater. And when you're on the Earth walking about or driving about, traveling, it's hard for you to envision the fact that you are in the midst of a giant crater. Now this was discovered on the tip of uh, the Yucatan Peninsula and it was in an area called Chicxulub, so they refer to it as the Chicxulub Crater. Now it's hard to even see from the earth, but when you get airborne and you take a look down you start to see a gigantic crater. 
Now, since you know this took place 65 and a half million years ago, the Earth has changed a little bit. There has some, been some erosion. There have been forests that grew up over it. So it's not the easiest thing in the world to see, but it definitely has a large ring. This ring happens to be, how big do you think it is? We know that the meteor that hit it was 6 to 10 miles wide. Well, it created a crater. You ready? I'm going to say a lot of things today that might blow your mind. 110 miles wide. That, my friends, is one big crater. What did it do? Well, first of all, the impact caused the Earth to shake. The sound would have been hard to even fathom. Here are some statistics from the impact of this uh, giant meteor. Six miles to ten miles in, in diameter. It was traveling approximately 40,000 miles an hour when it struck the Earth. I know. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen uh, what, it, what, what it looks like when a nuclear bomb is uh, exploded. The mushroom cloud that is created. Imagine a nuclear bomb times about two million and that's the size and the power of this meteor that hit the Earth. About two million nuclear bombs. Now think of that for a minute. What would that do? It's hard to imagine. It's so uh, devastating. What it did, first of all, shook the Earth. Sent reverberations throughout the entire Earth to the other side of the Earth. So the Earth is here, and if the impact takes place here, it was felt down there also. It was felt everywhere. So the immediate thing that it did was it shook the Earth, caused this gigantic crater, 110 miles long, uh, sent untold millions and millions and millions of pounds of debris into the atmosphere. It kicked it all up into the atmosphere, and it remained in the atmosphere, they feel, if not for months, perhaps years. What does the debris in the atmosphere do? Let's think about that for a second. Imagine, if you will, that cloud from the nuclear bomb, two million of them coating the Earth for a couple of years. Hmm. It's going to block out the sun. If you block out the sun, what is that going to do? It's going to make the Earth immediately a lot colder, immediately the plants that de depend on the sun to grow will die. What happens to the animals that eat plants? Well, in a short period of time, they're not going to have anything to eat. They're going to die. So then what happens? Well, then you have the dinosaurs that eat the plant-eating dinosaurs. And guess what? In a very short period of time, they're not going to have anything left to eat after the herbivorous plant-eating dinosaurs die. So it was what they would call a domino effect. Uh, it caused, they believe, a tsunami, several tsunamis, because it hit near water, too, which is just wonderful. But then again, two-thirds of the Earth is water, so the odds are that it would have hit water. So it caused mile-high tsunamis. Imagine a wave one mile high, a cascading force of water one mile high, smashing and drowning everything in its path. Oh, and of course it probably caused some earthquakes, uh, which probably caused volcanic uh, activity. Yeah, not a good day for the dinosaurs. So this all took place 65 and a half million years ago, right at the time we know that all these guys went extinct, and now we have a pretty good idea as to why. What else do we know about it? So we know about the iridium. That's evidence. We know all these things took place about the same time. Now, granted, the dinosaurs may have had some things, may have had some troubles before the, the meteor hit. Maybe they were experiencing a little bit of the change in climate that they weren't 
uh, adapting well to. Maybe they were having some things take place. Maybe their eggs were being eaten by other dinosaurs. So maybe a whole list of things were already taking place. Maybe there was plague. Maybe there was a disease that was starting to take care of some of them. And if that's so, then pretty much the uh, nail in the coffin was the giant meteor. So... Not the happiest uh, report ever done about dinosaurs, but nonetheless, scientific and factual. So I want to thank you so much for, for watching these reports. We're now going to read you the story from Dinorific Poetry, Volume 1. And the reason I wrote the poem is, and the reason I wanted to do the research on this mass uh, extinction is so many people ask, what happened to them? Where did they go? Why did they all die at the same time? Well, we think we have a pretty darn good idea why now? This uh, story from Volume 1 of Dinorific Poetry, written by myself and illustrated by my son Ethan, it's called The Fossil. There were many dinosaurs that you could say were docile. Thankfully, a lot of them were turned into a fossil. Studying these rocks can give us loads of information all about the dinosaurs and even Earth's creation. Now we know some dinosaurs had feather Lovely feathers sprouting, but years ago, some scientists were skeptical and doubting. See, everyday discoveries are made that keep us learning, helping us to answer all the questions that are burning. Evidence from fossils says a meteor came crashing, and Yucatan Peninsula is where it did the smashing. People thought that this was why, surely, most life was ended. Sunlight was obscured, and on it, most of Earth depended. Did it cause the dinosaurs to vanish? Some don't buy it. Now another theory claims volcanoes change the climate. But where should we be looking for a theory that's colossal? Right back where we started from, the all-important fossil. So fossil evidence tells us a lot as to what happened and when it happened and maybe even why it happened but uh, very interesting and uh, a subject that will be continued to be studied for years and years and years to come but we think we have cracked the case and figured out what the heck happened and why did all these big dinosaurs go extinct Chuxalub, Chuxalub Crater Thanks so much for watching. This is Mr. Mike for the Mechanicsburg Learning Center. We will do this every day, and we are changing our time starting tomorrow to 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, live on Facebook, and then we will post every single video to YouTube. So make sure you subscribe, and make sure you check out the other videos, and make sure you like the video. So thanks so much for watching. We'll do it again soon. Until then, don't go extinct.